pleasure to be here this morning to bring to you the message of our Lord. And I want to send the greeting of my church at Cabao Reform Baptist Church. Have a, have a happy or blessed Lord's Day. So I see old faces and uh, sure new faces as well. And uh, let us uh, go to the Word of God. Now the Lord Jesus himself tells a fact of life. Those who are well have no need of position, but those who are sick. Now in the same way, he said, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Those who consider themselves already righteous feel they have no need of repentance and forgiveness. But on the other hand, those who consider themselves sinners have the need to repent for the forgiveness of their sins. The gospel is for sinners, not the righteous, the Lord himself said. There can be no real appreciation of salvation until we realize our condemned status because of our sins. A gospel that downplays the gravity of sin downplays the greatness of Christ's salvation. The two essential elements of the gospel are first, man is a great sinner, and secondly, Christ is a great savior. Now the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Galatians chapter 1 verse 8 said this, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel, Contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be a curse. A gospel that does not uh, emphasize the two essential elements of man a great, is a great sinner and Christ is a great savior is not a gospel at all. This, is clearly, this truth is clearly highlighted in the conversion of the Apostle Paul. We can find the, the account of Paul's conversion in Acts chapter 9, the passage we have just read a while ago. The Lord met Paul, formerly Saul, at the Damascus Road. And then Paul recounts this event in his life twice in the book of Acts. First, in, ver in chapter 22, 4 to 16, before the Jews who were accusing him, he recounted this miracle of conversion in his life. And then secondly, before King Agrippa, in his defense, he recounted again this miracle of conversion that happened in his life. And the passage we are going to consider this morning is another one that uh, Paul saw the necessity for him to recount again the miracle of his own conversion in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. He, reco he, re he refers back to this miracle of his conversion to highlight the mercy and perfect patience of God to him, a worthless sinner. Now the message I would like to bring to you this morning, as Paul wants us, to be, uh, wants us believers, to see the greatness of Christ's mercy and patience in saving a worthless sinner like him, it is also my hope this morning that we see the greatness of Christ's salvation to worthless sinners like us and may result in a response of love and serve Christ more in our lives. Let me read to you Paul's letter to Timothy in chapter 1. And I'll be reading from verse 12 until 17. Verse 12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceedingly abundant 
with faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Now to him, to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God alone, who alone is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's seek the Lord's help. Our gracious God, we are about to open up your word. And we need the spiritual insight by which uh, uh, we can have through the work of the Holy Spirit in our means. So give us illumination, our God. In ourselves, we cannot comprehend spiritual truths. But with the Holy Spirit, we can. So we commit this uh, message to you that we may all be quickened by the Holy Spirit. And so we commit this to you in Christ's most so precious name. Amen. So the title of my message is Paul, a great sinner, Christ, a great Savior. So that is the two main points I'm going to bring to you this morning. And by implication, we have two sub-points to that. There is a great grace and a great change. Let me go first of all to the two main uh, points highlighting, highlighted in the conversion of Paul, which are the two essential elements of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, a great sinner. Now it says here, I am the chief, or I am the foremost of all sinners, the chief of all sinners. This is the first realization of Paul when Christ saved him. Christ made him see his sinfulness. Before he was converted, Paul considered his, considers himself as a righteous Pharisee who is heaven-bound uh, Jew. In 1 Timothy chapter 1.13, going back to, chapter, uh, to verse 13, he said, Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, an, an insolent man. Now, this is his own confession before his own conversion. But in spite of his wickedness before his conversion, he did not consider himself a great sinner. He believes that if there is someone whom God will bring to heaven, it will be him first of all. Because he's a, he is a pious Jew. He is a devout Jew. And when he in uh, his letter to the Philippians in chapter 3, verse 3 to 6, he said this, We are his, the circumcision we wo who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh, though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. If anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to seal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. That's how we regard himself before his conversion. But when we go to the book of Acts, we begin in chapter 8 in the book of Acts, we see in verse 3, his kind of life. He said in verse 3 of chapter 8, As for Saul, um, uh, referring to Paul, As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Then when we go to chapter 9, we read in verse 1, then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from 
from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that he found who were on of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so that is his intention. In Jerusalem, he sought to destroy the church, uh, dragging men and women to prison and consenting to their death. And he did not stop and chased them un up to Damascus. And he asked permission from the priests to give him permission to drag the, the believers to bring them to prison. And that is a very wicked thing to do. So as a self-righteous Pharisee, he thought he was doing a righteous deed by being zealous in persecuting believers. But Christ, we find, made him realize that he was a great sinner. He was humbled by Christ at the Damascus Road. He saw a great light from heaven and heard the voice of Christ himself and that made him blind for three days. It made him realize that he is the chief of all sinners because he has been fighting the risen Christ and has been seeking to destroy the disciples of Christ, the believers. Now obviously, there are more gross sinners than Paul. He did not investigate to see if he is the most wicked person living in his time, a considered King Herod. We find him in Acts chapter 12, 1, 2. About that time, Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And I would surmise that they, there are wicked, more wicked people during Paul's time. That, but Paul says that I am the chief of all sinners. I am the foremost of all sinners. Now think of today. You have the ISIS. You have the suicide bombers. You have the drug lords, the criminals who kills without hesitation. Now, I, I would... I believe that the, these people are gross sinners than the Apostle Paul. But the point is, Paul is saying here, when he realized that he is the chief of all sinners, he is seeking to point out when a person is brought face to face with the holiness of the Lord Jesus Christ, his or her sins, no matter how small, it can be, will be beyond comparison. Now, John Stott says uh, of this uh, text, he said that the truth is rather that when we are convicted of sin by the Holy Spirit, an immediate result is that we give up all comparison. We see ourselves as the chief of all sinners. That this is the experience of Isaiah himself, the passage we just read a while ago, that when he saw the glorious holiness of God, and he said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell with people of unclean lips because I have seen the God, the glorious God. Maybe you are like the Apostle Paul before his conversion. You consider yourself a good, as good, righteous, and heaven-bound person. You are helping others anyway. You are doing good works. Maybe you go to church every Lord's Day and your parents have taught you good morals by your parents. And perhaps every day or during the week, your parents have been doing a devotion from the scripture to you. But we find in Luke chapter 18, 9 to 14, 14 this is the uh, the story of the tax collector and the self-righteous Pharisee. And the self-righteous Pharisee uh, is thanking God for not making him like the tax collector, a sinner. But the tax collector is beating his own heart, his breast, saying, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And then the Lord said, who went home justified. 
the sinner, the tax collector, because he saw himself as an unworthy sinner needing the forgiveness of the Lord Jesus Christ. You must see yourself, first of all, like the tax collector. Have mercy upon me, a sinner. Until you realize that you are a great sinner, you cannot appreciate the greatness of Christ's salvation. Let me talk to you if there are those who are here this morning and you are still in your sin and you do not consider yourself self as a great sinner before this holy Lord, then you do not know Christ as a great Savior. Let me talk to you children. Maybe you still don't realize that you are a sinner. You are born a sinner. Your parents are teaching you the ways of the Lord. But until you children see yourself as a great sinner before this Lord, then you will never appreciate in your life the greatness of Christ's salvation. Perhaps you say, friends, you are not a murderer, you are not a robber, an adulterer, an immoral person. Maybe you are not like the man who, because only of, uh, you know, um, just um, counting alitan doon sa kalye, uh, took his gun, shot five times the, the man who is uh, just riding a bike. That's a wicked thing. And you say, I'm not like that. Yes, you may not be like that, but you are still a sinner. And again, if you persist in rejecting Christ in your life, you are a hell-bound sinner and you cannot change that. There are churches who ban the mention of sin or repentance in their churches because they say it makes people depressed and lose self-esteem. Just share the positive uh, thoughts of the love of Christ, the mercy of God. Never mention sin or uh, repentance. Give a message that will increase the self-esteem of people. But again, until you realize that you are a great sinner, no matter how confident, confident you are in yourself, you won't realize that there is a great Savior you, that you need for the forgiveness of your sin. The gospel is for sinners, not for the righteous. You will not begin to appreciate the greatness of Christ's salvation until you see yourself as a great sinner. Brethren, thank God He has shown you the sinfulness of your heart and that Christ revealed himself to you and you bow down before this great Savior and you are saved. And praise God for what he has done in your life. That is the first point. Paul, a great sinner, and we all are great sinners. Second point is Christ is a great Savior. Verse 16, it says, it tells us, I receive mercy for this reason that in me as the foremost Jesus Christ might display his per perfect patience in the ASB, uh, ESB as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. You know, the purpose of why Paul keeps on repeating the miracle of his conversion is that to highlight the mercy and perfect patience of Christ to the worst of all sinners. He wants us to see that. That is, one, that, that is one, what he wants to highlight. That this Savior is merciful. And that his patience is, or uh, forbearance, his long-suffering, is perfect. And Paul, as though he here is saying, I am a great sinner, but I have a great Savior. I deserve condemnation, but this Savior has a great mercy. And perfect patience. Oh, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a Savior. In Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, uh, Peter says, The Lord is not, is not slow to fulfill His promise, as some count slowness, 
but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach uh, repentance and friends. The reason why you are still breathing and enjoying life because the Lord is giving you this opportunity. He has been so merciful to you. He has been so patient with you. He has not judged you yet. He desires that all men be saved. I hope you see that. Don't wait. You do not know what will happen when you go out of this door. I'm not scaring you, but you do not know. Something might happen to you and you will lose this opportunity. Now is the time of your salvation. Because there is a warning in Romans 2, 4 to 5. Do you presume on the riches of his kindness and perseverance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. Until you see yourself as a great sinner and repent, you are simply storing up for yourself, yourself the wrath of God for the day of judgment. Now, brethren, your salvation is a proclamation of Christ's mercy and perfect patience. You are a great sinner. Deserving nothing of God's favor. But He not only saved you from your sins, He gave you eternal life. An everlasting life to be spent with Him in the glorious new heavens and new earth. And that is what Paul is telling you here as brethren. Your salvation, your own conversion proclaims that there is a great Savior who is merciful and whose patience is perfect. And he not only saved you, but gave you everlasting life. Now let us see the greatness of this Savior in verse 15, in 1 Timothy. Chapter 1. says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now the first thing you will see in this verse is that Christ is a great Savior because He is the incarnate Son of God. Paul was made to realize that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God in Acts 9.20. That is the very first thing he preached after his conversion. That Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus is the incarnate, eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, the true God who has become true man as well. The, he is now the God-man Jesus in glory, seated on his throne in heaven. This is what the Apostle Paul said in his letter to the Philippians in chapter 2, verse 6 to 8, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Christ is the incarnate Son of God. Galatians 4 and 4 to 5. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, so that we might receive adoption as Son. Here we have the eternal Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. He became man, truly man. And now He is the same he is the God-man seated on his throne in heaven. Now the second thing that we find here is that he is a great savior because he gave his life to save sinners. He gave himself as the once for all sacrifice on the cross. The substitute sacrifice for sinners that made him 
indeed a great Savior. He alone is worthy to be hanged on, that cro on the cross, to be our once for all atonement sacrifice. Nobody, not even angels, can do that. Christ, the Son of God, became man and gave his life to save sinners like us. Paul saw Jesus' life on earth as a great rescue mission. Men are in serious danger like himself. They are all going to eternal destruction. In doing so, he echoed his master's own assessment of his life work. The Son of Man, he said, has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Luke 19.20 it also invites us to go back nine months before the actual birth of the child Jesus to consider the message given by the angel to a peasant girl named, Mar named Mary. You shall call his name is Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Matthew 1, 21. Now Peter said, he bore our sins on the cross. And Jesus said, Matthew 10, 45, For even the Son of God did not come to be served, but to give, his, to give his life as a ransom for many. So brethren, our Lord Jesus Christ is a great Savior because He is the Son of God. And He's a great Savior because even being the Son of God, He humbled Himself. He came to this fallen world, gave his life as an atonement sacrifice for great sinners like Paul, for, great, for a great sinner like you. Now, he had not come to urge people to save themselves, nor even to make it known that salvation was available, that they would do well to seek it. He came to save. He is not a helpless Savior, brethren. That makes Jesus a great Savior because He came to save. And you are saved because He came to save you. He did not make it possible for you to be saved. That it's in your own decision, perhaps, if you will accept Christ, you will be saved. But He came to save you, and now you are saved. There is nothing for you to boast. He had you as an apple of His eye, even before the foundation of the world. You are one of the leg whom, whom he came to save. Brethren, that's a marvelous thing for us. In him, 248, man of sorrows, what a name for the son of God who came. Ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a savior. Sana ganun yung ating damdamin, mga kapatid. He came to save a simple, a sinful person like Paul. He came to save you, brother. He came to everyone whom He has chosen before the foundation of the world, those who would believe in His name. So, friends, again, if you are here this morning, pasensya na kayo, makulit ako. But I, I want you to emphasize to you that you are a great sinner and there is a great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no other way by which you can be saved. He came to save, save sinners and don't, please resist him now. You need him to be your Lord and your Savior. Come to him. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The same merciful and perfect Patient Savior is also the judge of all the earth. You need Him. What a great sinner, but what a great Savior indeed. A merciful and perfectly patient Savior. Let's take up the two implications out of these two main points. Because we are a great sinner and Christ is a great Savior, it takes a great grace to save sinners like us. And that is what Paul is telling us also in this passage. How can a simple person like Paul be saved? Paul's conversion was a work of divine sovereign grace. He said in verse 13 and 14, I receive mercy 
because I had, I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. We often sing John Newton's song, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. That is the man who realized that he is also one of the four of the chief of all sinners. Ephesians 2, 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of your works. It is the gift of God, so that, anyone, uh, so that no one may boast. Brethren, your own conversion highlights the mercy and patience of Christ, highlights the greatness of God's grace, glory to Him alone. God's sovereign grace in saving the unworthy Paul is the same sovereign grace that saved us and that same sovereign grace that will save every sinner that repents and believes. He makes us the assurance of this hope. It is a trustworthy statement and it is worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into this world to save sinners. Paul says, of whom I am the chief. He makes this assurance and he continuously gives this assurance to all of us. Brethren, if you are in Christ, you have the assurance of this truth. Your sins have been forgiven by God's amazing grace. No matter how great sinner you are, you have a great Savior who came to save you. And if Christ saved me, the chief of all sinners, then he can save every person who is also a great sinner. Whatever sin you may have, he can save you. There is no blackest sin that cannot be cleansed by the powerful blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do not think that you are a sinner and that is beyond the cleansing of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He can cleanse you now, whatever sin you may have. But finally, there is a great change. He said in verse 13, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, persecutor, and insolent opponent. Here we see Paul's life change. Everything about him changed. His former life. He was seeking to destroy the church. He is, he was, uh, he, he is uh, rejecting uh, Christ himself. But everything changed to him. From a persecutor to a defender of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. From a hater of Christ, he became a lover of Christ. From a destroyer of the church, he became, he became the defender of the church. From a hater of, of believers, he became a lover of believers. He spent time with them. In Galatians 1.22, he said that I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the testimony of a great sinner saved by a great Savior. The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now, what is the battle cry? of the administration of President Duterte. Change is coming. I just hope real change will come. But we know in this fallen world, change is elusive because this fallen world is changing indeed, but to worse. It is changing indeed and becoming, as Paul, as Paul said to Timothy in chapter 3, this world is not getting any better. It is getting worse because of sin. 
I know that President Duterte will do everything to bring about that change that he is seeking to happen in our nation. And I hope that change will really happen, but we know that in this fallen world, true change cannot happen. Until the heart is changed, there is no real change outwardly. Everything will just be a temporary change, no lasting change. And we always say that the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Until that heart is changed by the Holy Spirit, and by the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, nothing, no change can truly happen in a sinner. And true change can only happen when Christ by the Holy, Holy Spirit changes us. Now let us reflect for, the, for a moment. And the moment you are saved, your life began to change. Your life began to be sanctified. And you begin to be conformed into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ in holiness and righteousness. Let me just ask you, did you experience that change in your life? I do not care if you say, I'm a believer. I'm a Christian, I'm going to heaven, but that change did not happen in your life. You're not a believer yet. Because with a great sinner, there is a great Savior, there is a great chain, and there is a great grace, but there is a great chain. You cannot short chains or shortcut and leave the great chains out of the, uh, out of the uh, gospel. Your friends, uh, your life, you should have experienced the chains in your life the moment you were converted. So did it bring change to your life? Has it become the priority of your life? More than your own family, your own happiness, your own career. Is Christ the first in your life? Did that change happen to you? Or until now you have many idols in your life which are more important than the Lord Jesus Christ. You will give up Christ for anything. Because there are many idols that you love most in your heart. Have you grown in your knowledge and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ? Do you love him more now than anything? Have you been made willing to give up the thing that you love most for him? Brethren, I hope you see that. The Christian life is not something that is just a, a stationary thing that does not move forward. If you are a believer today, you should be moving forward. You should be loving Him more in your life. You should be serving more, Him more in your life. Uh, it should be now more than anything else is the first in your life. Now friends, or here, the one sure mark of true conversion is a changed life. If you believe now, yes indeed, change will come to you. So come to him and change will come to you. The chief of sinners was converted. And that means our hope of salvation. Is, uh, is something that we must uh, hold on. This, this means that we should not be despairing for those who show no signs of being prepared for conversions. We cannot tell. Maybe you are discouraged with your own families. Or your father, your mother, your siblings, your friends. They're not responding to the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because you cannot, you cannot save them. That's the truth. But Jesus says, said in Matthew 19, 26, With man, it is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. If he, God, if Christ saved a great sinner like Paul and like you, 
he can save anyone who is also a great sinner. Believe him, trust him. He will do what is right. Uh, right. If you believe in Jesus for eternal life, or if you may not believe on him for eternal uh, life, you may yet believe on him for eternal life. Paul, Paul's conversion is for your sake. It is to make Christ immense, long suffering, and mercy vivid for you. This is the Lord Jesus Christ who is inviting everyone to come to me. All who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your soul, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A great sinner, a great savior, a great grace, and a great chance. Let's pray. A great God, we thank you for this morning for reminding us from your word that we are a great sinner, but we have a great Savior. And we have a great divine grace for us unworthy sinners. And we have uh, a great change that truly will come and happen to everyone whom the Lord saves. So we thank you. Make us worthy of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Make our lives, indeed, a life that is conformed into the image of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you and we praise you in Christ's name. Amen. Amen.